meeting, and that was a very special time for me. Overwhelming, overwhelming. And um, it's, it's interesting how the Lord works, isn't it? And God is good. I wanted you to be able to speak tonight because we cannot keep these things in. We ought not keep them inside. We can keep them. But it's a sin not to share those things. Now, not everybody's had a chance to give a testimony, but you don't necessarily have time in a meeting like this for everyone to speak. But God's spoken to your heart. You need to let somebody know about it. We had a sweet time in our Sunday school class today listening uh, to our College and Courage folks talk about what God said to them. And it's all part of your accountability with the Lord. And you need to tell somebody. If it, you don't tell anybody, I don't think it happened. That's what I say. If you don't tell anybody, I don't think it happened. I think if something happened, you know, when I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior, I, I wanted to tell somebody about that. And if God has led you to something in this meeting, you ought to be telling people about it. If you're not telling them, it didn't happen. I don't care what you feel like. If you didn't tell them, somebody, it didn't happen. And so let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Now, some of you may feel guilty, and I'm getting ready to share a verse and move on and not give you a chance to fix that. <laughs> don't, don't feel bad about it. But for just a moment, I want to go back to Numbers 13 and 14. Can I do that? And I, I promise you, I'm going to try to be short. I could preach for a long time, but I won't tonight. I wanted you to preach. I want you to talk. The only thing better is, you know, I, we had these, Amy brought these, uh, these cards this morning, index cards. I almost passed all of them out tonight. I just want you to have that with the Lord. Not for me, for you. In fact, I think it would be wise if you took one of these home and wrote something down and put it in your Bible. Just have it for you, because you know what you and I are both going to do? We're going to forget what God said to us this week. Is that true? Has it ever happened to you before? And isn't it nice sometimes God will just have you run across that sometime and you'll read like, oh, yeah, that did happen. Oh, no, I need to, I need to get back there. It's just a little tool like that. I tell you, make it simple and make it specific. And God has given us this opportunity. This morning we talked about the opportunity that the children of Israel had to get into the promised land. And that's where we're at. We're on the cusp of that, moving in. I remind you again, the promised land is a picture of, of our Christian life and what God wants for us. It's not a picture of heaven. Uh, the promised land that they cross, eventually cross over into some 40 years later, they had to fight. Again, they had to, somebody had to get their feet wet and step into the Jordan. And they had to get in, they got into the land, they had an altar to build, they got into the land, they had to fight off the enemy. That's not a picture of heaven. We get to heaven, we won't be involved in any of those things, praise the Lord. But in this Christian life, part of us entering into what God has for us, all that he has for us is this promised land idea is going to involve a struggle. And thank God, where there is much struggle, we can find much strength. I said this morning, no struggle, no strength. Much struggle, much strength. Thank God for the struggle or you wouldn't have any strength. You wouldn't have the power of God flowing in and through you. And this morning we took a moment to look at the doubt that they had as they stood there and they, they, sent, they sent the 12 spies in for that time and to oh, look over the land and they said, and they told him, they said in verse 27 of chapter 13, we came into the land whither thou sent us and surely it floweth with milk and honey and this is the fruit of it. Verse 28, nevertheless the people be strong that dwell in the land. The cities are walled and very great and moreover we saw the children of Anak there and the Amalekites dwell in the land of the south and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan and Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people. For they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land the through which we have gone to search it, it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. And there we saw the giants and the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. And verse 14 is so sad. Chapter 14, verse 1, excuse me, so sad. And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. I have it written in my Bible. My pastor preached this so many times in Tennessee, it was a night when their dreams died because they refused to enter into what God had for them. And we're, we're right there. God has something for us. God has touched our hearts. We prepared for revival. We prayed for ourselves. We prayed for the preacher. And, 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 and we, can, we can keep moving in. I think we say we're having a revival. That could very well be. But I believe there's more that God has for us here. 
I mean, more in the sense of drawing us closer to him. And I talked this morning, it's God's will for us to see this church start at the Newport News next year. God's putting that together. We're not. We don't have to. He is. He's doing all that. It's God's will for us to build a church building. He will put that together. It's God's will for us to reach this county for the Lord Jesus Christ. And, you know, he puts it together, but we better be working at it like our brother just said to us. This is the fastest growing area. We're going to have more accountability to reach people with the message of the gospel. Even this week, I want to think and pray more about that, Caleb, and talk about what we're doing. But there was a lot of doubt. They had so much doubt about because of what they saw and you hear what they said. There was so much doubt. And if we want to live in doubt, we'll never see things work out the way God intended them. We can doubt things, but we should never doubt the Lord. God can do what he wants to. God can do what he wants to, and he can do it through us. Their doubt led them to a decision. Look at their decision. They, number one, they refused to do what God called them to do. They decided not to go. Imagine everything they went through in Egypt and going through that Red Sea and everything they went through up to that point, and they said, no, thank you. We're not going over there. Now, you and I are the same way. You and I are the exact same way, friend. God is working in your heart. He's dealing with you about how he wants you to live and what he wants you to do and the things that he wants you to undertake and the way he wants you to raise your family and the way he wants you to give your life to him. He's dealing with you about it. And some of you have just said, I'm pulling up right here. This is, com this is comfortable here. And that's not what God wants. That's not, that's not the promised land. That's not the promised land. We were, if we're going there, they refused. And, and our refusal to enter into all that God has for us is just as wicked, is just as wrong. And by the way, it didn't stop there. Their refusal turned into rebellion. Look at that. And I'll, I'll be honest with you. Anybody that will raise a hand to God to say, that's enough, slow down, wait a second, they don't stay in that place. They move backwards. And the Bible shows us here, these folks moved into the state of rebellion. I've got some people I'm praying for right now that are moving right there. Some people have attended this church, and I'm thinking to myself, what in the world? What is this fellow doing? He knows better. He's under, he's under, he's got some difficult things to deal with, but it's just, just refusing. It's, it's not, a, it's the choices that have been made for him are not the greatest, but he needs to enter into what God has for him, and he's saying no, and he's going down the path of rebellion. You, I promise you, you won't stay right there in that comfortable spot. You will turn your back on God. That's what they did here. Look, the people wept that night, and all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God he had died, uh, that we had died in this wilderness? And wherefore hath the Lord brought us unto this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be a prey? Were it not better for us to return into Egypt? And they said one to another, Let us make a captain and let us return into Egypt. That's rebellion, my friends. They were there and said, Moses, you're fired. Let's get somebody else and turn this thing around and get back. They went into rebellion. You cannot stay. You cannot refuse to enter into what God has for you and not fall into rebellion. You will rebel against God if you refuse to enter in. Now, this is a warning. We've had some wonderful services, but we need to heed the warning. It's amazing to think what happened there. They, they had an overt rebellion where they sought to get rid of Moses, but even a covert rebellion of inactivity. Someone said this, inactivity because of impossibility is still rebellion. Inactivity because of an impossible task is still rebellion. If you say, I, I'm not doing it because I can't do it, that's still rebellious. Because we have to depend on God to do it through us. Amen. And it's easier said than done. Some people struggle with physical things, habitual things, that they know dishonor God, and they say, I can't do it, I can't do it. But inactivity because of impossibility is still rebellion. Refusing to enter in, goes, it turns to rebellion. Faith looks ahead with courage. Unbelief looks back with complaint. Faith unites the people of God, and unbelief looks for someone else to blame. There is no one else to blame. It's amazing to think what took place here. Nevertheless, they said, oh, this is perfect. This, is, this looks like what we should want, but we don't want it. We're just not going to go there. But they didn't stay in that place. They turned around and rebelled against Almighty God. And what that led to was God's retribution, His judgment in their life. God wanted to wipe them out. 
God wanted to wipe them out. God said this, verse 11, And the Lord said unto Moses, How long will this people provoke me, and how long will it be ere they believe, they, they believe me for all the signs which I have showed among them? I will smite them with pestilence and disinherit them, and will make of thee a greater nation and mightier than they. God made a great deal with Moses. said, Let's get rid of the rest of this crowd. We'll start over with you, and we'll get this right. How about that? And it's amazing that God doesn't get more upset with us. And we live in an age of grace, and we have a dispensation of God's favor. And we don't live in an Old, an Old Testament economy. And thank the Lord for it. All right, it's like I said the other week, I would probably be under a pile of rocks somewhere. And so would you, because of the way they dealt with things. Thank God, but listen, it's amazing to think that God doesn't get more frustrated with those of us who refuse to enter into the promised land. A church that would not enter into what God has for them to do in reaching a community. A Christian who refuses to read their Bible and pray and spend time with the Lord. Why does God have so much grace and mercy on us? He could treat us just the way he did right here. And Moses, to his credit, he interceded for the people and God's judgment was not as harsh. It was not as harsh, but God still chose to judge, judge these dear folks. Because they turned their back on him. In verse 20 through 38, it said, And the Lord said, I have parted according to thy word. He listened to Moses' intercession. That's why we ought to pray for people, by the way. We ought to pray for people that we love. He said this, But as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord because of all, all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness and have tempted me now these ten times and have not hearkened to my voice. Surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers. Neither shall any of them that provoked me see it. He goes on to say how Caleb and Joshua have a special place. They say in verse 31, Your little ones, which you said should be a prey, them will I bring in, and they shall know the land which you have despised. But as for you, your carcasses, they shall fall in this wilderness, and your children shall wander in the wilderness forty years and bear your whoredoms until your carcasses be wasted in the wilderness. God judged them. And God will judge you and I too if we don't enter into what he has for us. I do not pretend to have the mind of God and I'm not trying to scare anyone, but it's, it's amazing to think that we could just stiff arm the Lord and expect to go on our merry way. So I would say if God's spoken to your heart this week, if he's asked you uh, why, why are you doing something, why you're not repenting, you better start repenting. If God is calling you in a certain direction and you're saying, I'm not ready for that, you better ask, ask, you better ask for God's help. I, I don't know why you wouldn't turn that way. God has the ability to really make things difficult for us. Thank God he doesn't in his love. But he will judge us. And maybe the, maybe, maybe the, maybe the most difficult thing, as we talked about, Brother, Brother Smith talked about this week, is just standing for the Lord in that one-on-one -on -one conversation at the Bema seat. Not being ready. Not being ready. I want to be ready. I can be ready if I'll keep saying yes to the Lord. God judged them. And you know what happened? Look what happens here. And I'll, I'll wrap this up. I'm, I'm, I'm breaking my promise to you here, but there's so much. Israel tried to repent after the fact. But I believe God's callings, even though they're without repentance, in many ways there's a shelf life to all of it. I know God gives grace, and God will work with us but according to this, if we take a lesson and take an application for this, look here in verse 40 through 45, and they rose up. Moses explained to them what God said. In verse 40, they rose up early in the morning. This is the children of Israel. And, and, and by the way, those ten spies, now if we, we didn't take time to look at this, but God took care of them with pestilence. He got rid of those men just like that. It reminds me as a person who has influence over other people, I better, I better make sure I'm following God. I better not lead this church astray. If you're a person of influence in a church like this, we better not be guilty of leading people astray. What does the Bible say about them dealing with children and even dealing with, I apply it to dealing with young Christians. It would be better that a millstone be hanged about our neck and be cast into the sea than to lead somebody astray. The Bible says in Galatians 1.8, if any man come unto you and preaches any other gospel, let him be accursed. That, that means let his soul be damned to hell. That's exactly what it means. God's very serious about that. So they rose up early. They took care of those ten men. They're gone now. But here, they'd gotten, they, God had gotten their attention. Verse 40, the children of Israel, they rose up early in the morning and they got them up into the top of the mountain saying, Lo, we be here and we'll go up into the place which the Lord hath promised, for we have sinned. This really wasn't a true repentance. Moses said, Wherefore now do ye transgressors the commandment of the Lord? But it shall not prosper. Go not up, for the Lord is not among you. 
that ye be not, uh, be not smitten before your enemies. And for the Amalekites and the Canaanites are there before you, and ye shall fall by the sword, because ye are turned away from the Lord. Therefore the Lord will not be with you. But they presumed to go up unto the hilltop. Nevertheless, the ark of the covenant of the Lord and Moses departed not out of the camp. Then the Amalekites came down, the Canaanites, which dwelt in that, in that hill, and smote them and discomfited them even unto Hormah. Look, they, they tried to repent. One day the nation was in mourning because of their plight. The next day they were recklessly trying to accomplish God's work apart from God's will and apart from God's blessing. They did not get in when God told them to get in, and it was too late. It was too late. They thought because they had confessed their sin, God was going to change his mind and give them the victory. And listen, God, God does have grace, but I, honestly, we, we don't have any right to presume upon that grace. We can't, uh, one, one commentator says, how many Christians today realize their failings and then try to make up for them in fleshly activities that only lead to discouragement and defeat? We learned this morning that our service for God should grow out of our true worship of God, right? If you try to serve the Lord, that's not worship. Our worship grows out, our service grows out of our worship. When it doesn't, we find ourselves completely exhausted and burnt to a crisp. But if our service will grow out of our worship, we, can, we can, don't have to be weary in well-doing. For in due season we'll reap. If we faint not, we won't faint. Listen, we can't substitute activity for obedience. We can't substitute activity for service. The carnal mind cannot serve God and is timid when it should be bold and bold when it should be timid. They had it all backwards here. They were insincere. They were too late. They presumed even though Moses warned and they were defeated. And the only thing I can take from it is this. It seems that God's plans and directions for our life can sometimes have certain open time, open time windows for when they are valid. It's like this. It's a, when NASA is launching a satellite to go to Mars, they calculate the orbits of the planets, and depending on what they want to accomplish, there are certain windows when they can launch the spacecraft. If they don't launch the rocket before a certain time, it cannot meet its objective. And so you and I just put God off, and the train is going to pass us by. We put him off individually. It'll pass by for us. You put him off as a church. It'll pass by for us. Our window of opportunity will close. And may God help us not to look at it that way, not to, not to put the Lord off. Esther came to the kingdom for such a time as this, right, in Esther chapter 4. Her behavior before the king was a risky behavior, but it was what God called her to do. If she had not uh, uh, approached King Ahasuerus, her people would have been wiped out. God put her there for a time like that. God was intent on delivering the Jews, but if she didn't do anything, God hopefully would have used someone else, but she would have lost her opportunity. You and I have opportunity. I understand the idea of a window of opportunity doesn't hold true for everything. There's some things that God always has in his will for us to be doing. It's always a good time to repent and ask Jesus into your heart if you're not saved. It's always a good time to be filled with the Spirit. By the way, God has to draw you. I believe that first. We don't get saved when we decide it. God has to decide those things. It's always a good time to be walking in love with our brethren. But it seems to be other times in our life there are certain specific missions that God has for us. And the window, if we don't go through the window, the window will close. And you, you know who misses out? We do. We do. We do. And may God help us to see there's a window of opportunity open right now for us to get closer to the Lord. To get closer to the Lord. We must determine to move forward by faith. We must watch for Satan's snares in all of it. We must resist all faithless effort and all faithless influence. We must keep our eyes on the Lord. May God help us. May God help us to take the opportunity we've been given. This is an opportunity. A revival like this is an opportunity. And I'm just, I'm of the belief that God's not done with it yet. Amen. That's just what I'm trying to communicate today. I'm not trying to be weird about it. I'm not trying to be spooky about it. I just don't think God's done pushing the point. I don't think God's done speaking to hearts. I don't think God's done working on some of us until we actually surrender. And what that means then, and I don't mean to cast any accusations, that means there are people under the sound of my voice who still have not surrendered to God in some area. I have no idea what that would be. But that's between you and the Lord. But I just want you to know that you have an opportunity. And God has the window open, the doors are open, but it won't always be that way. And we're going to sing the song in just a moment, but it pass me not, O gentle Savior. 
hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Do not pass me by. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer as we complete this meeting tonight. I was trying to push this point as far as we can. You know, it took Noah about 120 years to build that ark. He was a preacher of righteousness, the Bible tells us, but there came a day when the ark was loaded. God shut the door, and it was too late for anyone to respond. And may God help us to respond while the door is open. You know, life is so fragile, it's, it's so short. It's a true statement. I don't mean to sound manipulative in any way, but we could be here in a meeting like this today and tomorrow we could be in heaven with Jesus. We've learned that, haven't we? We ought to take the open doors and the open windows and walk through them. And whatever God's speaking to you about, it's okay to listen to him. It's okay to entertain those thoughts. It's okay to say yes to him. And so if God is leading you, I want you to follow him with your whole heart. And let's just say that yes to the Lord. God, help us in these moments to get all that you have for us. According to thy word, we ask it in Jesus' name. Would you stand with me, please? It's 306 in the hymn book. We'll open the altars if you'd like to pray and seek the Lord. Maybe someone's still in the meeting who hasn't trusted Christ as their Savior. That could happen in a place like this where you wouldn't want to disappoint anybody. But I want you to know, once again, you're among friends. You're not going to disappoint us if you get saved tonight. You're not going to disappoint us. Well, I can't imagine being any happier than something like that would happen. Maybe you're still holding out on the Lord in a certain area of your life. God is, you know you're displeasing the Lord and you don't even have the strength to give it up. But you ought to ask God to help you. Maybe you're like me, you struggle with what we call the routines of the Christian life, reading that Bible and praying. Maybe you're like me and you struggle to be the witness that you ought to be. Maybe you're like me and you struggle to love people and think about their ever, never dying souls like you ought to. I just want the Lord to deal with me that way. We're going to sing a verse or two of this just as God leads. But if you need to come and you need somebody to pray with you, that's fine. Let us know. But the altars are open. Let's seek the Lord. If you're in your seat, 300 and seat, 306, excuse me, pass me not, O gentle Savior. Let's sing it together. Pass me not, O gentle Savior. sing this last verse in just a moment. 
God is speaking to people's hearts, and we're just trying to follow the Lord. With this service getting ready to close, I just want to appeal to you again. If God's speaking to your heart, don't put him off. Don't put him off. Don't put him off. Come and seek the Lord. If you need someone to pray with you, let us know. I'm concerned for some of us that we're just not drawing closer to the Lord. May God help us with all of that. We still need a, a righteous and holy conviction of sin, don't we? We need to see God for who He is and how much we need Him. And I don't want any of this to pass me by. We're going to sing this last verse and our service will close. I implore you again, if God's speaking to your heart, you come to this altar and deal with the Lord. Let him have his way. We'll sing this last verse. Thou the spring. Thou the spring of all my cup. been good to be in God's house today. I appreciate you being willing to share your testimonies. If God's still speaking to your heart, just listen to him. Let him have his way. You may need some help with that. I wish you'd call on us if you do. And we want to, we want to be a blessing to you and just help you follow the Lord in any area of your life that we can. Let's pray for one another. We'll do that. I think it's a righteous prayer to pray. and Because I, I believe it's going on that some people are wrestling with the Lord a bit. I really believe that's going on. There's nothing, nothing weird about it. It's normal. It's natural. Because our ways are not God's ways. Now let's pray that people will just stop wrestling with the Lord and yield to Him. Amen. And give in to what the Lord was. Pray that for ourselves. Continue to pray that for ourselves. But God has been good. And uh, we've had services. And of course we had a little break on Saturday. And we've had church today. And it's, it's like all this is coming to an end in one sense. We're out into the world tomorrow, doesn't it? It seems that way. But we go with God. And uh, we go with a God who's ever listening and ever prompting. And so... Be God's agent tomorrow as you slip out into the world to do his work. You're his missionary, amen? amen? And let's have a voice for God, and let's continue to seek the Lord, and we'll be praying for you. It's good to have our, the Hortons, our friends, with us tonight in the meeting. I'll tell you what I'm going to do, brother, is to dismiss your family to the door. Would you mind if we did that tonight and just gave you the right hand of the fellowship? And Brother Caleb, if you'll help them to the door. Aren't you glad they're with us tonight? Amen. And I'm um, so glad for that, and we want to be an encouragement to them. And uh, when are you guys headed back up to Canada? Tomorrow morning. Well, good. I'm glad your, your holiday ended up not getting blown away. Amen. <laughs> At least in this part of the world. And, uh, even missionaries need, need a little respite every once in a while, don't you think? And I'm glad that they could do that and glad we can support them. I just want you to encourage them when you walk by. Tell them you're praying for them. That's what we do. We pray for them by name every Wednesday night, don't we? And uh, pray for folks like that. How many of you pray in, in North America? I often, uh, sometimes I pray in South America, but a lot of folks are praying in the North America area, and that's where they're at. And so let's encourage them that way. Let's be faithful to the Lord. Pray for one another. Remember Brother Gil Whitley. We'll be back on Wednesday evening, God willing. And our Master Club's back in session. And we'll be back here. Uh, have an extended prayer for revival and for the needs of this church. And let's see what the Lord will do. Amen? And uh, let's, let's continue to seek the Lord in all of it. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer as we're dismissed.